Ukraine's foreign minister told reporters in Brussels today that in order to continue to stave off Russia's invasion, his country has just one request of NATO, more arms. My agenda is very simple. It has only three items on it. It's weapons, weapons, and weapons. Just yesterday, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken shared that the Biden administration would send another $100 million worth of anti-armored Javelin missiles to Ukraine. The total contributions of the United States since the start of the invasion now total at least $1.7 billion. In addition to the Javelins, yesterday the White House announced a new round of sanctions levied at the Kremlin, including ones targeting President Vladimir Putin's adult children. Administration officials justified the decision by saying they believe Putin may be hiding his assets with his daughters. Independent journalist Manny Morota joins us now from Pittsburgh and not Ukraine, despite what we said at the top of the show. Manny, welcome back to Rising. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here again. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for joining us. So what is your uh, understanding of, of kind of the situation on, on the ground right now? How are things how are things going? Well, I remain in contact uh, with the many people I met in Ukraine. I understand that right now uh, the situation is somewhat reversing. They're calling it maybe the miracle on the Dnieper right now, uh, in reference to the miracle on the Bastula that happened in 1920, in that they're reversing the tides of war against Russia at the moment. Um, the offensives in the north have gone quite well. Uh, Kiev uh, has broken out of encirclement, sort of, and Ukrainian forces are now in control fully over Kiev and its suburbs for the most part. Um, this does not leave Ukraine out of danger, of course. Uh, Russian forces are still very active in the Donbass um, and in the eastern part of Ukraine, but at the very least, they're making substantial and measurable progress in the north, and that's very encouraging to all the Ukrainians on the ground. What do what are the Ukrainians that you're talking to make of uh, the argument that you hear from uh, some on the Russian side that say, well, actually, this whole entire you know, uh, slaughter and like invasion of the of the Kyiv area was actually a feint to try to distract Ukraine from defending the east and the east and the south. How do, how do they feel like they're going to be able to handle the next phase of this operation, quote unquote operation? Right. Well, I believe that um, they're going to try and focus all their efforts on the East at this point. I don't believe that Kiev is in any danger anymore. Um, but that is just something that I've heard from my contacts on the ground there. Uh, the Russians will continue fighting in the East because there is a Russian-speaking uh, ethnic uh, majority there. Um, and uh, they're going to tr keep trying and capturing uh, to capture those Eastern areas, the Luhansk and the Donetsk Oblasts that they have tried to capture before and that they've tried to hold on to. And so expect the war, the next phase of the war, to continue to be attritional in the east uh, and all the efforts to be focused there. But I think it's safe to say that for now, Kiev and even areas like Zaporizhia are out of uh, danger at this moment. And when you talk to your contacts in Ukraine, are you hearing the sentiment that, you know, um, you know it's time for uh, for a uh, diplomatic solution, even if that involves, you know, a loss of territory, for instance, perhaps the Donbass, or are they heartened by the, you know, the kind of quasi victory or, or perception that they pushed uh, the Russian forces back and it's a, no, we're going to keep the country entirely intact and continue this war if that's what has to happen? Well, exhausted by the war that has taken place so far, my contacts in Ukraine maintain overwhelming optimism and confidence in full Ukrainian victory and full Ukrainian control over uh, these areas that have been disputed. Uh, many of them are beginning to come back from the west and go back east again uh, mm. to move back into their homes in Kiev and other areas in the east. And they feel confident that Ukrainian military forces, especially with the aid of NATO weapons, will be able to push the Russians out of those eastern areas and take control over them once again. So we're looking at full victory here and confidence in restoration of Ukrainian sovereignty over all regions of Ukraine. And White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki defended the administration's weapons exchange in Eastern Europe as purely defensive. Let's watch that. This administration has sent everything from medical supplies to laser-guided uh, rockets to the Ukrainians right now. While this administration is making them more lethal, is the thought that we are bolstering their defensive capabilities, or is the administration confident that we are bolstering their offensive capability to, in fact, you know, expel Russia from their borders? Well, their country is being invaded. so. 
it's all defensive. They're defending their sovereign country and the territorial integrity of Ukraine using these weapon systems that the Department of Defense has long categorized as defensive systems. You know, I, I often criticize the White House for splitting hairs o over terminology, but that actually feels reasonable to me that if Russian forces are on Ukrainian territory, then anything is defensive at that point. What, what's, what's your take on, on that, that spin from the White House? Yes, it's absolutely reasonable. What uh, Pisaki said is correct, that any military action that takes place on Ukrainian uh, soil is by nature defensive. Uh, the only situation in which military analysts feel that it would be offensive is if uh, Ukrainian tanks, for example, roll into Russia, roll into Belgorod, or some people are even saying a place like Kursk. Um, that's not going to happen. Uh, the Ukrainians have made it very clear that they have no intention of breaching Russian territory. Uh, you will not see Ukrainian tanks in Moscow next year, but you have a, a war that is purely defensive on the part of Ukraine, where all military action is taking place on sovereign Ukrainian so, uh, soil. So what Pisaki said and how she qualified this war is completely correct. It is a defensive conflict. They are defending their land at this moment. President Biden named the discovery of, quote, major war crimes and more specifically the execution of civilians around Kiev when describing his administration's rationale for new rounds of sanctions. This comes just as the New York Times verified new footage showing Ukrainian soldiers summarily executed at least four captured Russian soldiers. So, look, I mean, there are clearly, you know, a, a war, is all, war is itself an atrocity. Atrocities are absolutely being committed. Uh, by Russians. But I, I think there are certainly there are examples of atrocities on the other side as well, which is not to kind of both sides this conflict because, you know, one side is invading the other. But, uh, but you know, what, what is the, the sentiment you're hearing about uh, from the Ukrainians about, you know, just Putin? Mm -hmm. Because we think, it, it, like, to, you know, to bring this to a peaceful resolution, it, you know, might be the case that Putin has to come away from this you know, feeling not like totally a total loser or something, or that he's going to face regime change at home, that if that is, you know, he would actually continue. He, if he feels like he needs to win, then he's going to keep fighting. But do, do the Ukrainian people you talk to see that dilemma, or are they, one could understand them feeling very, very justifiably vengeful, uh, but, and, and, you know, not wanting that to be the result, even if it does prolong the war? Right. Uh, my Ukrainian contacts definitely do feel a sense of vengeance and anger about this. They're in shock about it. The words that I'm hearing from multiple people constantly is never forgive. Um, and a lot of them are characterizing the whole Russian people uh, as responsible for this, these atrocities that we're seeing in places like Bukha, which is a suburb of Kiev in which over 300 civilians were killed. Um, and so that's what leads to the things that we see, such as the New York Times uh, tweet that uh, Ukrainian soldiers are killing Russian soldiers. There's a sense of vengeance and anger. Um, I think that they understand that Putin wants to walk away from this, uh, feeling as if he has won something. However, at this point, they're not ready to forgive Putin, especially, uh, but the Russian army and in some places, the Russian people, uh, for what has been done here. It has just shocked and horrified the entire world. Um, and the only way that this can be uh, prevented in the future is if the pe the perpetrators are brought to substantial uh, war crimes tribunals at some point in the near future. And so, is it is it your sense that the kind of Ukrainian public at large, when they when they see evidence of Ukrainian atrocities being committed against Russian soldiers, that there's actually a kind of a shrug or a, you know what, you know they they deserved it. You know they they came in and they slaughtered people in Bukha or they. You know, they did X, and so this is payback. And I'm wondering if you're, if we're seeing, if we're like halfway into a, a spiral that is going to uh, quickly become just incredibly personal, like you said, civilian against civilian, like Ukrainians blaming Russian civilians, Russians saying that all Ukrainians are Nazis. This is a very dangerous and touchy subject to discuss. But once again, what I'm hearing from my contacts are phrases such as never forgive and all Russians are beasts in this situation. And I, un I understand where that comes from. I understand that sentiment, given what we have seen of the atrocities committed by Russian soldiers in the East. 
But yes, it is somewhat of a dangerous and slippery slope into further atrocities. But war is never uh, an attractive prospect. It's never, um, it's never clean. It's never friendly uh, entirely. And so we have to understand that these things will continue happening and it's horrifying. But um, as long as we continue documenting them, collecting evidence and bringing those responsible to justice, that is what will be important in the future. And the Ukrainian civilians, I hope, will come to understand uh, and accept uh, that not all Russian civilians played a role in this uh, atrocity that we've seen. Yeah. Mm. Two inflamed publics feeling you know, righteous rage at each it's other. A horrible situation. That's how tin- blood feuds tinderbox. start. That's yeah. How- yeah. No, well, Manny, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, gentlemen. And we'll have more rising right after this.